Hello and welcome to DDOcast episode 501, recorded live on Saturday, January 13th. I'm your host, Patrick. With me this week, we have returning to the show, Asheris from Kyber. Welcome back, sir. Hey, thanks for having me back. I thought this was 502, though. What did I say? 500? 501. 500, no, 502. It is 502. Right. Making sure I'm in the right place. And this is my first show since 500, so I just wanted to say congratulations. That's awesome. I should probably update the title slide to actually say 502. But yes, we are on episode 502. Um, sometimes I have to, like I'm doing that, and I am just kind of do that from memory and from rote just because I'm doing like five other things at the same time when I start the show. So it's great. Um, anyways, 502, uh, part two of our uh, review of The Mists of Ravenloft, which will be coming at the end of the show. Um, this week's screenshot. Let's talk about that, because this is a fun screenshot. Uh, this is uh, Jackie Stab is sent through the mist in the 349th screenshot of the week. Thanks, Hakuna, for sending in this week's screenshot. Nice little shot of the... Um, those are the mist. Those are the Ravenloft shrines, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love the new shrines they have in Ravenloft. Yeah, really it's fun. Cool. I, I pay so little attention to them. Like, it's like, oh, hey, they're new shrines. And then, like, that, that was it, and I just kind of moved on. <laughs> That's why I was like, uh, these are the ones from Ravenloft, right? One thing I like about them is they're visually different with the mm -hmm. wings because the challenge I always had with the uh, Forgotten Realms ones was that they seemed very similar to me. Well, even so. the, the Eberron ones are as well. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. But that's a great screenshot. Yes, it is. We like to talk about Dungeons & Dragons online nearly every weekend. You can watch us through Twitch, YouTube, the DDO forums, iTunes, or from our website, DDOcast.com. DDOcast is hosted by Cyber Ears, the awesome podcast hosting network. Shows are usually available within a few days of recording. Uh, and the next show will probably be next Friday. Uh, and I hope to have more information on that uh, in the coming days. Um, but so, on the podcast this week, uh, we are going to be looking at Update 37 Patch 2. Uh, so we can talk about that. Uh, and of course, um, for those who haven't caught up to speed with uh, kind of how we're doing things now, um, what happens is we're, we're just going to talk about the news uh, in this section, and then we have a pre-recorded um, for part two of our Ravenloft review. Uh, it's a three-part, um, that is. So next, um, probably not next week, probably the week after, uh, we will finish that up. Um, just kind of recap them. I'm recording the topic and the news section separately now, and then splice and together for the finished show. If you're watching on Twitch, uh, you should have access to everything. It's just going to be a little bit more fragmented because um, I'll, I'll record the the discussion part earlier and separately, uh, and then the news, it'll just be the news se sections. But if you're watching on YouTube or the forums uh, or listening on iTunes and all that stuff, it, it'll be a, a still a complete show uh, edited and post together, that kind of a thing. Um, but that's what we're doing these, these days. Um, the hope is to kind of reduce a little bit of the time load, give you guys a little bit shorter of a show so we're not spending an hour and a half and then kind of short shifting the news and the community news and, and the topic that we're talking about. And I want to give all of those things a more complete um, time and treatment without making our, all of our shows three hours long because uh, that, that could happen if we weren't careful. So uh, in any case... Uh, we will do now. Let's uh let's talk about the game news, and we did get a patch, um, for update or seven. This is kind of an exciting patch. Uh, I'm not gonna lie. It uh, is. There's a lot of fun stuff in here. Uh, that I think people, people have already said that this is awesome. We love this. Uh, this is great. Uh, so look into that. Um, first thing is uh, well, some of this stuff is kind of. The boring stuff at the top of the classes. Um, Eldritch Blast no longer start and fail in public spaces. Um, Warlocks no longer display their weapons while using Eldritch Blast. You know, that's important. Um, that's but... actually really huge to me. <laughs> I, I enjoy the fact that you can't see your weapons. It uh, creates the immersion of the Warlocks a lot better. I don't know. To me, it was a big deal. This is one that, that kind of I thought was a little weird. Um, Warlock Enlightened Spirit Knockdown Ward no longer displays on the buff bar. Yeah, I don't know why that matters. It, it, but I mean, I guess it there's, there's only you can only have so many things up there. You, you would think that they would want that to be there to begin with, but um, I don't know. My my issue with knockdown wards is is that there's a number of them in the game, but they don't always seem to work. It kind of depends on the mob. 
Uh, they corrected an issue where barbarians could get locked out of their intimidate skill if they had certain enhancements trained. Um, I'm not sure if that's the intimidate bug that I've been uh, having. And it, I haven't it, seen. I haven't experienced that. Well, there, I know that there there has been a bug with intimidate, and you, it just wouldn't work for a while. And I know I've had that on my barbarian. What I don't know is if have I had that problem on other characters. <laughs> that's what I don't remember. Um, but I know my barbarian has had that problem. Uh, I just don't know if it was only my barbarian. So, um, Artificer's Battle Engineer, Endless Full Sight, not properly, is considered to be an action boost. Uh, why that's important is because there are certain things that trigger on an action boost uh, that you may wish to have. Absolutely. Uh, it also, it, it has always uh, gotten extra uses from action, like increase in action boost uses. But uh, um, How does Cool Attack now displays in your debuff bar? Um, see, and Exalted Angel's Astral Vibrance is now better at detecting health changes on targets close to the character. Uh, Legendary Dreadnought's Advancing Blows is no longer erroneously considered to be an action boost. <laughs> Oops. Um, see, they fixed a couple sentient filigrees. Um, this is where it got fun. Uh, the drop rate of tomes has been increased in Curse of Strahd, Old Baba's Hut, to Father the Just, and Riding the Storm Out. I bet you didn't even know those raids dropped tomes. <laughs> <laughs> That's how low it was, right? We were talking. That's I, great news. Much rejoicing. I think we we were talking about this yesterday, right? Like, yeah, have you ever actually seen a tome drop out of, out of any of these rates? Definitely not in riding the storm out. Yeah, I, ba back in the day, maybe in Defiler, but it was pretty rare. It, maybe one ever. Yeah. Um, also, Ravenloft raids now have a higher drop rate for plus eight ability tomes and seven to eight upgrade tomes. So, it's interesting that they, that's called mm -hmm. out separately. But there you go. I can't yeah, tell I you because we did we did see a plus seven tome on a uh, Baba's hut that was unbound. Oh, nice! Which is pretty cool. It in the past, what had you know, raids have not seen a lot of tomes for a while. Um, no, I think it was intentional with Shroud that it, Shroud doesn't really drop raid tomes. Um, but other raids used to drop tomes, and usually what it was is like the highest plus that you could get out of the raid would be bound to character, but the other ones would be not be bound at all. Um, so I, Tower, I don't know if that's Tower kind of, of true. Tower of Despair is the last raid that I remember tomes dropping in with regularity. It's been a long time. Because I don't even recall Caught in the Web dropping tomes no, that heavily. I don't remember it dropping anything other than standard loot tables, which is probably yeah. why people have this perception that tomes have been... Um, the drop rates for tomes have been a lot, lot, lo lot lower because you don't find them in raids, yeah. and that's where you're gonna really find the the higher tier um, ones. I haven't looked at the um, the reward list for the runes in Strahd or Baba's Hut. It would be really nice if tomes showed up in there, since those are the equivalent for twentieth reward lists. But I really doubt that'll ever happen. You know, I I would I agree they should be in there, but I would not be opposed to them being like two or three times as much runes yes like yeah, the I agree higher number of runes um mm -hmm. i've also said on the I, show that it'd be nice if if there was some sort of like incremental thing with legendary quests maybe that you could uh get like little bits that you can then turn in for um like legendary tomes and legendary uh things or you could even use standard tomes and stuff as well but yeah because one of the things back in the day that really prolonged the life of raids was the tome drops mm -hmm. even after you got the loot out of them people were running shroud just for the plus threes they were running todd just for the chance at the plus fours i mean that's that was a big deal um i'd like to see that come back of course in there some weren't way, shape, store tomes back then no there so... weren't that, that was your only source for them as well but um, and I think that that might be part of the conflict here is how high do these drop rates get and how much does that cannibalize the um, the store sales? Yeah, I'm I'm going to guess not too much. And, you know, I, I kind of figured the way that I kind of approached it was when plus seven tomes were on sale uh, and I had recently said, OK, I'm going to focus on these this short set of characters. Uh, and a lot of those characters, you know, had plus three, four tomes and all right. They're on sale. I think they're like twenty to thirty percent off, maybe even thirty five percent off of Supreme plus seven tomes. I just bought some plus seven tomes uh, for those characters. Um, I think when you're talking about like if you buy, it depends on how they do it because you couldn't buy a plus six to seven Supreme upgrade tome. You just had to buy the plus seven. Uh, so yeah. the the price jump was pretty significant if you were already pretty close to that to having a, a plus seven. 
if you just had mm-hmm. plus sixes across the board, getting a plus seven was functionally the same price as if you had a new character that you bought a plus seven tome for. So, yes, I think it's it's going to kind of ebb and flow a little bit uh, in some lines like that. But at the same time, I'm sure most players are going to have characters that they're just not going to buy tomes for. And yeah, they, you know, I've got some characters that I won't do that for because they're not my prime characters anymore. Uh, but hey, if I find one, I'll find someone to use it on. That's for sure. Oh yeah, absolutely. You no. Know. Um, also, writing the storm mountain father just uh, can now drop plus seven and plus six to seven upgrade tomes. Uh, so that's kind of fun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I also figure, you know, plus eights are going to show up in the store sooner or later, right? Oh, absolutely. So. They will, and and people are going to get those um, mm-hmm. for sure when they come out. I really hope that they. Uh, had that drop rate high enough on riding the storm out. That's that's a raid that has only been around for about what seven or eight months, and um, it'd be nice to see it actually get run because it, it came out at a bad time, and now we've got two arguably more fun raids and mm-hmm. raids with better base loot. So that raid needs something to keep it on the uh, on the horizon for people. I like riding the storm out. Um, I actually think it's a better raid than Baba. Uh, it's a little bit more interesting, but I think it, it it came out when Racial Reincarnation came out, which was a problem yep, for it. it was. The loot was not um, as desirable across the board. Uh, there's some nice stuff in there, but you know people weren't clamoring about getting it like they were, they have been with uh, Baba and Strahd. And Strahd. The other thing is it, it just has such a high bar to entry because of the electric damage thing. Yeah. I, I still does. think they need to uh, reduce the damage across the board, just reduce the damage and then increase the number of stacks. So if you, you can take more shots, but it, it ramps up uh, higher if you're not paying attention because it's less punitive for just being in the raid and it's more about managing it uh, than it is right now. Because, you know, one to two shot you know, for a new player, uh, even on normal, if you don't have any gear or anything, if you get a stack of three debuff on the on electric damage and you get zapped, you're toast. So I think that's I that's the major reason why it never really took off as a raid. It's an interesting mechanic. It's just too punitive for the newer newer people in the raid. Um, and it lasts too long. I agree. The, the that, time, the, the length of time of the raid isn't too bad. No, the length of time of that segment where you're dealing with that electrical damage and you're running around out there. Um, if that was shortened, if there were fewer switches to hit, for example, then the punitive nature of it wouldn't be quite as bad either. Yeah, but, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see, other things, going back to the release notes, uh, now that we've gone completely off topic. Uh, let's see, Glamour... I- <laughs> These are the fun notes. Uh, Glamour items no longer count towards set bonus totals. <laughs> No longer trigger, trigger a set bonus recalculation. Yeah. Oops. Oops, yeah. And now, mirror, and in related news, Mirrors of Glamoring are now on sale. <laughs> Maybe they should have done that in reverse, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> a little shady. Uh, let's see. Legendary Crypt Raider set, Sword of Shadows, Legendary Green Seal uh, set bonuses, Ravenloft, or Docents, uh, Lucy, they're all working more correctly now. Um, Void the Endless Cold. That looks like it's made of ice. Uh, I need to check that. I didn't didn't pay attention. Even ran that character that has that, too. So there you go. Uh, Let's see. Old Baba's Hut. They changed several... uh, Several changes have been made to make Old Baba's Hut to make the interior section perform more reliably. Uh, I have not had it bug out uh, since then. I haven't run it a ton, but haven't had it bug out since then. Uh, they fixed... yeah, I heard you could uh, tumble through the barriers or something, but I'm not sure if yeah, that caused a problem. Yeah, that's another thing. Um, they fixed an issue where Raid could get into a state where it could not be completed if certain abilities were used to bypass a door. They added code to prevent a race condition that could cause some encounters to not reset correctly. <laughs> or race condition. <laughs> that's kind of a weird thing to do that, but there you go. Uh, yeah. They fixed an issue where characters could bypass through all barriers. Certain barriers can no longer be bypassed, so there you go. Uh, yeah, there's there were a couple issues with that. Like you could bypass the barrier, some of the barriers that were up, and that could cause the raid to become in an incompletable state. That was a problem. Um, there was an issue where uh, the second time through the hut, the, the quest wouldn't update, um, and you could actually yeah. end up finishing the quest, finishing the raid, get the raid loot, and not get a completion, so you could run it again. Um, and sometimes that would happen when that would happen. 
the totems and puzzles wouldn't even reset. Uh, so, uh, maybe they should have fixed that by just not making us run through it a second time, <laughs> or made the puzzles a little different. Is, yeah, yeah, something. The, the rate is a little repetitive. I, I don't mind that there there's kind of five phases, as it were, but certainly it'd be nice if there was a little bit difference going on there. Yeah, um, I agree with that. But at the same time, you know, it's a time thing. It would have taken longer to, to do, I suppose. So I heard on Lemania that you actually go, had to go through the hut three times. So I'm glad that's not true. That's a little much. Yeah. Uh, let's see. They corrected an issue in Lines of Supply that allows them to reopen the quest. Yay. Much rejoicing. Yeah, yeah for your sagas. <laughs> uh, let's see. The Abbot Chest in the Abbey of Sunrise now drops the same treasure table as the End Chest. Hey, there you go. That's always fun. I can confirm that after last night. It's good stuff. Oh, nice. Uh, oh, right, because we, we both got stuff out of that. Remember. Uh, let's see. They fixed various text issues uh, in Dinner and Oath of Vengeance. Uh, they fixed some stuff in Ravenloft and Temple of Elemental Evil, where combat music was sometimes played on top of non-combat music. Uh, and then they... <laughs> the music in the quest, Missing, Sinister Storage, In the Flesh, Undermine, Eyes of Stone, Framework, Lost in the Swap, and Saint Asylum now plays as originally intended. To which I must ask, one, how long has that not been playing as intended? <laughs> Two, what does it sound like? Is it different music? Is it new music? Yeah, I have no idea. I can't recall, like, especially like a quest like Framework, I don't recall there being any music in there. That may be why. <laughs> that may be yeah. what the problem is. Um, I was wondering, it's kind of weird how they reuse some music and don't, like, they've never reused the music in um, Finding the Path, which is, like, my favorite music in the game. Yes. Very unique music, yeah. Uh, I agree. And it's fun that it's so unique, but you know, they've used they've reused other it it makes sense that you could use that in like the dream world just in general. So I don't know. Yeah. Um another popular one, uh rescuing bookbinder family members and bookbinder rescue is now optional and failing to do so does not fail the quest. Again, much rejoicing. Especially, Especially for I mean, on Reaper. That, that's well not just Reaper, but a newer player that doesn't really know what's going on and um, I think we can. Can we just like get rid of most fail mechanics? <laughs> yeah, I'm. Yeah, what, what's the one? Uh, the de the dealer departed or whatever, whatever it is. Uh, that one. Faithful departed. Crazy. Faithful departed with the venerated. Yeah, yeah. Those, those sorts of questions. Well, are they annoying. did. They did make that easier. You only have to save like two of them now <laughs> out of the five. That's good. Um, they yeah. did that a while back. Uh, but as far as I remember, that I think that basically leaves us with um, let sleeping dust lie. Has a fail mechanic, yeah. uh, and um, Slavers of Shrieking Minds has the same fail mechanic, although it's yes. a higher number. Mm -hmm. um, although that number ten is a lot. Ten things don't kill ten things is a lot easier than don't kill five things. Uh, I'm yes. Saying, so now, um, so what what is the uh, completion then on this? Because the old completion was when you boss. rescue, you just have to rescue one person or what? I don't know. I haven't run it. Uh, yeah. Because you had to get all four of them out, and that was the uh, the deal. Four or five. Yeah, four or five. Probably now you just have to find them, uh, oh. and then once you find them all, the boss spawns in the middle. Okay. Something to that effect. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But you can, and this is important. You know, at that low level, a fail mechanic is really hard to get around, especially when you're dealing, dealing with traps. So if you don't have a rogue, it's almost impossible to do on anything other than normal without mm -hmm. having one of them die. And if you don't do that quest, you can't run the capstone of the Sharn Syndicate. And yeah. you're talking about a very early, um, probable purchase of, for a newer player as well. So yeah. it's good that they changed that. Oh, we, we forgot one of the um, worst fail mechanics in the game at early low levels. Stealthy repo. Oh. You, want me to, <laughs> you can't kill the profits? I'm okay with that one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I agree. It is kind of annoying, but I, I do... It is good oh, as an introduction I, one, but the, you know, mm -hmm. don't kill those things is a little less problematic. Than well, no one else is trying alive, to kill them. But... Yeah, trying to keep them alive and not letting them die is a completely different thing. So, I would not be opposed if they they made it a little, they made some tweaks or something, or maybe if you kill a prophet, you get like a, a sudden burst of kobolds spawns or something like that, but mm -hmm. um, more punitive and less failing. Sure, yeah. Um, the other really popular one, uh, Flagging for the Litany of Dead, has been updated. When talking to Sir Roan in order to turn the cigar fragments, 
Players can now trade their copy of a completed sigil for a new fused sigil. This allows players to use the fused sigil instead of the eight separate sigil fragments to enter Litany Dead on subsequent lives. Fused sigils are bound to character. Players currently flying for Litany Dead will need to true reincarnate and turn in a completed sigil in order to get this new item. Yay. Praise the Lord. <laughs> That's great. That really is. Well, it's such now, a great only... quest for reincarnating. Now you only have to fight for it once ever. That's fantastic. Much needed, long overdue. That's amazing. That's an extra two thousand or uh, or two hundred or k XP every life minimum. Yeah, that you can get very easily. Not that we necessarily need would... a lot more XP, but still. No, but it, well, I also enjoy that quest. It's kind of a unique quest in the game, yeah. which is nice. I would love to see them turn Shadow Crypt into a situation where once you've run the quests you don't have to reflag the same life because um, it's annoying that you have yeah. to uh, use an opener for that if you don't want to rerun them. Yeah, th that's, that's yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> that would be nice to change too. Next on the list, guys. Let's fix that next. Yep. Um, let's see. Uh, bonus days for the week. Uh, Champion Hunter week. Uh, you can find all the prizes at Mysterious Remnant Traders in the Hall of Heroes now through January 17th. Uh, let's see, store news, Dress to Kill, you can get 30% off of Mirrors of Glamouring, Bypass Timers, Cosmetic Outfits, Hats, and Helms. You can also get a free bell of opening with the coupon code UNLOCK uh, through January 18th. Uh, so, great, uh, nice little fun stuff there. Yeah, those uh, Mysterious Remnants traders, if you're not familiar with that, definitely check that out because the Mysterious Cloaks and Bracers are great, and those... Um, Farm pots, you know, the, the uh, what are they called? The um, endless flasks, the endless flasks are really nice too. There's some really good ones in there. A little annoying that and you those... can only use one at a time, but yeah, I, I wish they would change that because there's balance reasons, be <laughs> yeah. But those aren't around more, more than what maybe two or three times a year, so it's good to get on those if you can. Good time to buy some stuff. All right, let's talk about community news. Uh, we have the 266th Chronicle. Uh, Zoham is putting together data on the new Ravenloft item, Fate, the Knower of All. Uh, <laughs> so this this is a really interesting item. Uh, and what it does is it's a throwing dagger. Uh, but it's... Er, let me rephrase that. It's a throwing, quote, dagger. Uh, that's actually tarot cards. Uh, but it has, like... Think... Um, like the limbo uh, feet meets Shirati. So every, I don't know how long, how long it flips over, but it flips over frequently and you get a new random effect. Um, there, but there's, I mean, there's a set number of them, but you get different effects on uh, your weapon. Uh, and he has been doing quite a bit of data collecting, uh, I must say, to get that, uh, which is kind of neat to see what it, what it does. Um, it's, it's actually less complicated than you would think because it's, a lot of it is is very similar effects because it it's if you think about a playing card like there, there's actually I, I said tarot cards I don't know if that's the correct official like canon name for them but I think they're I think it's called like taroka tarot, um, that cards. sounds I think that's what it is yes um, mm -hmm. but it's kind of like having a you know just a just think of a deck of playing cards it, there's four suits different numbers of cards um, so the different suits have and and then the numbers like there's actually if you look at his table that he made, there's a pattern to it, right? So it's less complicated than you would think it would be, but um, it's still a lot of great work there. Um, let's see, the yeah. it is. It's a, it's a fun item too. Um, if you haven't, you know, probably haven't pulled one yet. Maybe not a lot of folks have, but it's really interesting. Yeah, randomness can be a lot of fun, I must say. Uh, let's see. Uh, Highlights of Malkir hosting Riding the Storm out uh, this weekend. That's today, if you're listening to the show live. Uh, on Saturday, they're doing that tonight. Uh, so they, they'll be doing their... I think they usually do their teaching raids for about five months, four or five months. So you know, if you're on Salona, it's a great opportunity to do this. If you're not on Salona, you can check out his YouTube page because he, he usually stri streams them live. Uh, so you can see... And then you can just go and watch the video later as well. So if you want to learn I've how to do that. some of the raids. Yeah, I've checked out his uh, YouTube page and, and watched some of his... Uh teaching raids on some of the newer raids before I've had a chance to run through them. It's very useful. Yeah, he does a really good job with it, too. So, uh, Let's see. Some players, detail players, are already planning ahead to the summer's Chen Con. Um, tickets aren't even on sale, and people are already planning to meet up. That's fantastic. 
The, the guild for the week, the recruitment forums are <laughs> it's not actually guild. The recruitment forums aren't just a place to advertise your guild, it's also a great place to let the community know you're looking for a guild to join. Uh, if you do have a guild and you want to um, to get your guild into the Chronicle, uh, you can email contact at standingstonegames.com with the subject line guild hall uh, to get your guild feature. I have a feeling that they could use more guilds to be featured in that way. More guilds don't want to do that. Uh, the Chronicle comment, describe your main character in one word. Badass. Good choice. I'm trying to think of which... My first problem is I had to figure out which character is my main character <laughs> at this point. Um, I don't know, can I yeah, say... Which one do you run most? Is it... Uh, you were on PJ for a long time, but then... Yeah, he's kind of... It's hard to say, because my main character is not one of... Like, what I would classify as my main character, or at least especially like in terms of persona and and like my title character... He's not one of the characters I'm focusing on anymore. Um, so that's that's Shamgar the yeah the Warforged Warforge barbarian Bar yeah, which you know burly would probably be or maybe aggressive would be a good <laughs> good word for it. You could probably just describe all of my characters as aggressive. <laughs> Generally, I tend to play a little bit more aggressively than I probably should. Um, so the uh, best defense is a good offense. Not always in this game. Um, there's there have certainly been times, particularly in um, Legendary Shroud, comes to mind where I get to the point of uh, frustration and I just raise and jump in and swing my sword until I'm dead and then just rinse and repeat. Um, and you can kind of tell that I'm kind of bored and tired with with what's going on because I get into that mode <laughs> and you get to the end of the quest and I've got like thirty deaths in, in the raid. That quest, I think, is still a high water mark for melee frustration in terms yes. of how it's designed so yeah. i was very excited to see that um melees are playing a lot better and it's a lot more fun to be a melee in baba's hut and strahd and just in the um ravenloft in general yeah so. they're more forgiving uh of being you know if you get hit you don't just die that's really nice uh, yeah but there's other things i actually think baba herself uh because she's a caster really kind of attacks melee pretty well, uh, but not in a debilitating, frustrating way. No. Uh, see, fansite news, uh, we got a shout out for, um, this is an error, it's not a two-part review, it's actually going to be three parts of Mr. Ravenloft. Uh, Dido Players News uh, had episode 161, Damsel Dio ran House Kenneth Challenges in their latest show, uh, Sip found a new group on Kenneth in his latest BioBreak blog, he moved his character over to there. Uh, Gaming SF headed into the mist. Fretz is chronicling a Reaper life for level zero to two. Uh, if if you want to know how to get through um, lives quickly, pay attention to what Fretz does. So if if he's he's chronicling that, so that'd be a good thing to to look through is what quests to run and how to run them and stuff. Uh, yeah. Those guys I go think... through a past life about every four days or something like that. Yeah, I think his forum name is Lawful Good, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, yeah, if you look for his posts in the achievements section, um, he's got some videos out there as well on YouTube. I ran a couple lives with them, was fortunate enough. And yeah, it's it's intense, but uh, they get through it quick. Yeah, that's pretty nice to ride their coattails. Uh, Blood Licker sacrificed named loot for sentience. Um, Polani killed spiders. Botch the Girl streams DDO every weekend on DDO stream. DDO uh, PL, that's the Portuguese uh, live stream. Uh, they went epic. Even in crew flagged for Curse of Strawn, the latest streaming for Even, or streaming with Even, and McVegan Pants runs Harbor Quests on Elite. Uh, and then Cordovan ran through Patch Notes and went into Amber Temple on the weekly Wednesday live stream this week. Uh, other stuff going on. Uh, a very bad guild ran Lesson of Deception. We'll link to that. Uh, as well. Uh, Tears Palladium, uh, that, actually, that was the blog about uh, speeding stuff to sentient weapons. That was kind of fun to read. Um, let's see, Didocast News. Uh, Didocast Platt should be back on Tuesday. Uh, we'll be starting Season 3, um, which I'm mostly using as, as a designation of when we <laughs> started and stopped. Um, and also, I think it helps with the numbering system, so I don't end up with Didocast Platt 500 at some point, although that would be pretty cool. Uh, yeah. That's probably not going to happen. Anyways, um, season three. <laughs> is, yeah, I'm calling it season three. Uh, so that should be uh, restarting uh, on Tuesday. 
uh, 5.30 p.m. Pacific time uh, on twitch.tv slash tdocast if you want to watch us uh, play hey, let me ask you... more difficult content than we probably should be. <laughs> let me ask you a question. Um, have you gone through your TR caches and cleaned them out for your sentient weapons yet? Only the characters that – only like the main characters are the ones that I've – the ones that I've reincarnated, yes. It's been so nice. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I'm glad I held on to that stuff now, though, too. There's still but, some uh, stuff I can't bring it to get rid of. That's true. Like, yeah, there's I've some stuff some... that's hard to get rid of. Like, I can't uh, – my fighter has a full uh, five-piece epic Ab Abishai set from Chronoscope. Oh, yeah, nice. And it just feels so wrong to feed that. You know? I feel the same way. I, I have the claw set and the three-piece Abishai set, and I worked so hard to get that back yeah. in the day. Like, I, can't, I, 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 I can't. I know I'm not going to wear it. that but... to them. You know, it's just not going to happen. Um, I'm also glad that they uh, allowed the seal shard scroll items, like the epic sword of shadow, um, to uh, be able to accept sentience, because I'm really looking forward to uh, slapping one on there at level 20 and seeing how that goes. Yeah, it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, all right, let's do lightning post. We had a couple people chiming in last week. Um, Musky Elon said it, it took advantage of the fast travel to get to all the quests with the fresh ship buffs and ran back to the taverns to get the explorers afterwards. Uh, talking about the explorer area uh, guides in Ravenloft. Very handy, I must say. Yeah, I, I, I get what people were saying about liking to do the exploring, but I think the, the fast travel is the best way to go, especially with 12 quests and that and the size of the adventure area. If it was giant hold or den or desert size, that's one thing. But yeah, when it's that big, when it's that big, I don't want to have to go hunting around. I think for we him. had a guildy who ran to one of the quests, and it took him like a half an hour to get there. <laughs> so it very well could, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, Especially see. if you stop and kill stuff on the way. Mm -hmm. uh, Solo Zing uh, said he thinks a good middle ground on exploring would have been a platinum pay to the far shifter. He agrees with uh, Voodoo that exploration is fun and exciting. I don't know. I think it 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 does make it a little prohibitive, right? If it just costs plat, but sure, a little plat sink in the game is not necessarily the end of the world either. Uh, I don't I don't think that would have moved the needle one way or the other, though. Maybe not for us, but there's certainly newer players that that could be prohibit cost prohibitive for. That's a good point. If you were looking at you know someone who came to the game for Ravenloft mm -hmm. and and sped to level 10 and then they're going in there on level 10 and they have to pay plat to get places that might have been a turn off yeah uh let's see fuzzy deck 81 so these loving raven laugh the graphics sound and atmosphere and overall design are very solid and cohesive aesthetic i completely agree uh, he loves Absolutely. the little bits you can find all through the quest and exploring areas expanding on the backstory uh, i would recommend if you haven't if if you've run raven and you haven't like at least read through the text um once either turn it on in your chat or do read it once at least get the the full experience it some of it's really good it really is and you know, my first time through the quests um i read all the you know, several of the quests have the find three or four notes or five notes i read all the notes you know or all the journal pages when you're mm -hmm. in um uh castle ravenloft for a couple of those quests that that really adds a lot of flavor to things and you know taking your time to look around it, it's worth it there's a lot of things in the nooks and crannies that are off of the critical path of the quest that are really fun yeah indeed i uh, said so death house is an amazing as the first proper quest for the chain a classic horror feel that really helps set the scene for what's to come much more horror than kind of the rest of the rest of it but but yeah it really sets it well yeah, that and Bone Grinder were probably the two that were the most horror based, I thought. And <laughs> and, it, and they come early in the process. Yeah, they do. Um let's see he's a nice point about the teleporters breaking immersion, though he thinks their absence would cause more problems to make it less accessible for groups. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh he still had a lot of fun just wandering the the explorer area. Uh from a Slayer rare explorer perspective, the mod is similar to the Desert or Giant Hold, so it's a nice medium kind of level with the rares relatively common. Much as all having multiple potential locations is the only really annoying part. Yeah, <laughs> don't bank on finding them all in a single run like other places. They spend a long time and they're coming through it really thoroughly. Although you know, on the flip side of that, you don't have to find them all for the fog of war to go away. So, yeah, there's that. Uh, he loves the design of Castle Ravenloft itself. First time through, it's worth making sure you have plenty of time to thoroughly explore or get lost. <laughs> I 
think I think for most people it's it's make sure you have plenty of time to thoroughly get lost than to explore. Uh, that's kind of what I've I've heard since few people's experience. Um, you can find some of the optionals, meet a few interesting NPCs, and learn your way around the place, including all the hidden routes. That's what's really fun too is they really brought back secret doors heavily in this content, yeah, and maybe that's maybe that's because of the PMP you know aspect of it, and they were there in the uh, PNP. But I, I love the fact that every couple of feet I was getting a secret door notice on my characters. Yeah, having a good rogue through the series can really uh, give yourself some shortcuts and a couple extra chests, but it's neither it's not prohibitive either, which is good. No, it isn't. It's a good balance, I think. Yeah. Uh, the troll also commented. Uh, was, um, Raven oh, is he Lop- back? Uh, I don't know if he ever necessarily left, but I don't pay attention to the forums for much. Um, he, this is a, a guy who has uh, something of a troll persona. Um, I don't, I don't think he's quite as trollish naturally. I think, he, but he kind of uh, role plays a little bit of the persona um, as a yeah, kind of like Cargon, um, which is kind of fun um, to a certain extent. Uh, I've never had a problem with him, but in any case, uh, he said the Ravenloft is fantastic. SSG Turbine has been phoning it in for years, but this has actually given him some hope that DDO has a future. My heart is now only two sizes too small. I think he is. He's saying the Grinch is a troll. Uh, I don't know. Well, the Grinch kind of is a, a troll. Um, yeah, I guess he kind of even looks like a troll. Uh, yeah, he does. In any case, uh, so glad he's enjoying it. Uh, as well. Uh, see, our survey question of the week comes from Rampel and Galanda. Which is better overall, House C crafted weapons or legendary green steel? Well, it would kind of depend on what you want to do, I would say. But um, in general, I'm, I would prefer the legendary green steel, um, especially if you're taking it to tier three and getting one of the, uh, you know, like the vacuum or something like that to proc. Yeah. I would say, um, I would go one step further and say, Pretty much any of the named weapons you can find are probably going to be better than something you can craft at that level. Assuming you find something that um, matches what you're doing. The only time I would I would kind of point toward the House C crafted weapon is is something more niche. And even then, um, and what I'm talking about is something more like designed to attack one thing specifically. Um, like a holy silver weapon for attacking some some certain types of of mobs, stuff like that, right? Yeah, or something that's ghost touch, so you can kill right. uh, reapers. That that that's where I've seen it used is to make sure you can bypass the incorporal. Um, that's a big one. Uh, but these days, especially if you're running reaper, the, the need for vorpal, which I don't think you can craft, you can. Um, leans people more towards random gen or the named items that have the Vorpal on it or or other effects that are, you know, basically proccing so much damage that it's equivalent to a Vorpal. My, my general perception of crafted, how C crafted weapons is if you're talking about like levels one to maybe six to eight, you can get some nice stuff in there because you're not really going to find a lot of named weapons there anyways that are that good. Um, no. But pretty quickly, you're going to start finding that named weapons in general are going to be better um, even when we're talking about some of the, you know, you know getting a DR breaker or um, ghost touch and stuff, you know, the things that come to mind are, are needing metal, certain metals and good, which you can make with the Thunderforge weapon pretty cheaply. Even if it, you know, yeah. just getting a, a base Thunderhole, Thunderforged uh, or Thunderhome Forged weapon, you know, and maybe uh, the first two tiers are really not that hard to get, especially since you can buy those ingredients on the, the auction house generally. I don't think they're as cheap as they used to be. But, you know, a Tier 2 Thunderforge weapon, you can use level 26. You know, it has all the, the metals types on it. You can put a a, go, a good augment in the, the red slot, and you can get 35% armor piercing on it, which is really good. Um, so that covers a lot of bases. Um, the other one that really stands out for me, granted, this is coming from a, a rating perspective more where you generally need more damage reduction bypass, but... Um, a good bludgeoning weapon for liches or skeletons uh, yep. is kind of a, an important one, I think. But you can get that out of like the Ravenloft weapons now. You can get one there. Um, you could craft some out of House C, the, the Mornload ones, which are actually pretty darn good. Um, 
so there's a lot of options with some of that stuff as as well. So um, I would generally say it, it, across the board, I don't even look to house see craft weapons for anything below like level six to eight, depending on what I what I have or what character I'm talking about. So I'd agree with that. Level four, a, a ghostly good something or um was it like you can do uh holy of ghost bane or something or it's something they can do ghost uh hit ghosts and is holy and is um one of the banes that affects reapers yeah that's great because at that, that low level you're gonna have a hard time finding anything that's gonna work very well against them anyways yeah uh, but other than that i don't only look out look too much for weapons gear is is a little easier and you can kind of fill in your your missing slots a little bit better uh, in that perspective which i'm having to do a lot of for ravenloft <laughs> yeah yeah for for accessories the house sea crafted stuff really shines there um, especially if you've got the ability to put the third yeah. slot on there yeah uh which by the way if you need to do you just need to get house sea favor to get the marks uh, and then you're good to go yeah it's not too bad all right, uh, we're going to wrap this up and kind of move into transitioning to uh, part two of our Ravenloft review. Uh, so thanks for listening to the show, and thanks to Asheris for joining me today. Anything you want to say on your on the way out here? No. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I had a good time. Uh, thanks to all the other contributors for DDOcast, uh, especially those who are helping with our Mr. Ravenloft review. Uh, thanks to Sandy Stone Games and Wizards of the Coast and to Cyber Ears. Uh if you'd like to support the show, you can visit our website at ditocast.com or you can support us on Patreon. You can hit us up at ditocast.com for our show notes, MP3s, uh, our calendar, uh, other fun stuff. Uh, you can also uh, leave us a comment, email me, ditocast at gmail.com if you'd like to be part of the show, if there's maybe a question you'd like to hear us answer. Um, I mentioned in the chat that Reapers are lawful outsiders. Uh, I think you might be able to use another Bane weapon as well, but Lawful Outsider Bane is a good one. Um, in any case, uh, you can also find us on social media. Uh, follow us at latest cast updates. At DDoCast is the best place to do that for. Um, our closing tip for the week comes from Niha Anthelanis. Just have fun and play the way you enjoy the game. Uh, so stay tuned for part two of our Myths of Ravenloss review. But before we do that... Uh, we do have a segment, uh, so please enjoy Greetings from Corthos with Grand Darn. Greetings from Corthos. Let me start off with a big congratulations to Patrick on the 500th episode of DDOcast. It was great to hear Patrick, Jerry, Siegfried, and Anne talking about how far the podcast had come. It is indeed something very special, and here's to many more to come. I hope everyone had a great holiday season. I know I did. I had a chance to spend a couple of weeks at home eating lots of delicious food and spending time with family and friends. This is the third edition uh, in the Greetings from Corthos series. And in the last one, I talked about my motivation in starting up uh, some form of activity to welcome new or returning players to the game. Today, I will move from there to talk about different things that you can do towards the same goal. A lot of what I'll be talking uh, about today may seem obvious for the veteran player, but I want to talk about uh, a new player's beginnings with the game because that's where the journey begins. We've all been there, learned about the game, and left those beginning moments far behind. Let's start by thinking back to when we first started playing DDO. What was your first contact with the game? Before you even know where things were in the game. Do you remember difficulties you had? The UI not being the most intuitive. Where is the playing list? How do you switch to a raid group? Where is the biography tab? Maybe think of when you start playing a different game and the difficulties you have there to remind you. Once we figure out how to do what we want to do in a game, we often forget these initial problems. But like everything, 
they're a barrier for new players. It's easy to forget what we went through at the start and sometimes lose patience with new players who just don't know how to do things yet. When I started playing, I thought the best approach was to watch, don't say a thing, observe, and learn. Because of where I'm living right now, I pretty well only pug. I witnessed a couple of rough interactions and thought, well, better just shut up and learn by watching others. This may be a natural start for a lot of players, although they might not realize that when you join a group, letting the leader know that you don't know much about the game is the best way to get help. I mean, it could also be that people get a little tired of announcing to each new player they meet that they're new and don't know their way around. To help new players, it may take a little intuition. You can kind of tell when somebody doesn't really know the quest or the way to the entrance. Maybe you're not getting the communication responses you're used to. There is an organized structure to communication when joining a pug group. You say hello, you say what you're going to do on my way, or maybe that you'll pick up some buffs and be right there. Maybe asking for a share is the first indicator that the player is newer to the game. For the group leader, one of the first courtesies you can offer is to share the quest. For the new player, you'll want to figure out your way to quests on your own uh, as a part of getting better at the game. With the ever-increasing number of quests in DDO, this is getting to be a bigger and bigger hurdle for new players. And I think SSG can see this. One thing you can do to help new players is reach out to them proactively when you sense these indicators. We allow a new player to uh, group a certain amount of time to get to a quest. If they don't get there in a reasonable amount of time, that might be another indicator that they don't know the way. Maybe in the more tricky quests, someone does a no-no. There are lots of these in the game. Traps, puzzles, game mechanics. Being up front with not knowing something is important as a new player. If you let others know, people are going to help. If you are an experienced player and you see these indicators that a new player may not know the quest, ask if anyone is new to the quest and do what you can to help them out. Take them under your wing, even if it's for a couple minutes. It could make for a memorable experience for the new player starting out in the game. Now, I'm not saying go all out of your way to make someone feel at home but do what you're good with. Beyond that, let me go through a few general things we can do to help new players. Putting up an LFM is a good start. Assisting new players that you come across in a group is an easy way to help them out. When you do TR, give Corthos a try. Especially if your server is the default, you'll see a lot of questions coming up in Corthos chat. With the Corthos greeter activities, I'll see a lot of groups starting up in chat instead of through the LFM panel. Starting up a group in Corthos is also a proactive way to get new members uh, for your guild if you're looking for new players. I'll sometimes see recruiters come out to Corthos, but there are a lot more who just stay in Stormreach Harbor or Market. If you're looking for new guildmates, Corthos is a fertile ground for recruiting. Experienced players will spend little time in Corthos, but new players will spend a long time there sometimes, just hanging out, especially with the default server. Sometimes I'll see them leave to harbor and market and come back and spend more time in Corthos. Other new players only see Corthos and don't move beyond that to Stormreach. I'm not sure how many, only SSG has those numbers, but from anecdotal observation, there's a good number. If your server has the default, you'll see a lot of low-level characters in the Who panel and a lot of people putting up LFMs. Even if you are not the default server, I see people coming on and asking questions just like before. It's easy to get into the mentality that only the default server has new players. So if you are one of the other seven servers, that doesn't have the default, you will get no new players. This is not so much the case as I've been continuing the greeter activities on Orion. 
there's still some new players out there. All the more reason to try spending a little more time in Corthos. Making new players feel welcome is one thing, but in a more general sense, if others see you helping out, they're likely to help out in their own way too. This could be something passive, like chance meetings with new players in Quest, or active methods by searching out new players in-game. Let me leave you with an image. Don't look at Corthos as a backwater village that should be run through and left as quickly as humanly possible, but as a point of first contact. If DDO is your home, then Corthos is the foyer, or front door. Having something there to make people feel at home is kind of nice. You know, like having flowers there. You might say, well, we're not the default server. It isn't worth it. But helping out new players shouldn't be a server-specific thing. There are new or returning players on every server. Well, I'll leave things there for now. In the next submission, I will continue with more detailed ideas I've come across in helping out new players. Until next time, take care. Welcome. We're talking about Ravenloft uh, this week. We're continuing our Update 37 Mists of Ravenloft review today. I'm your host, Patrick. With me this week, we have, uh, from Ravenloft, Draculetta. Hey, everybody. How's it going? We have our Ravenloft expert, Evil Beaker. Hello, everybody. Uh, and we also have Voodoo. Welcome back, sir. I'm still wearing my pajamas. <laughs> Last time we were talked about uh, we were talking about Ravenloft. We talked about the story area, the quests, uh, and kind of on that whole vibe. Uh, we're going to start today. Uh, we're going to talk about the raids, which I know not everyone has done. Uh, I'm guessing Voodoo, you've run them both. Oh yes, uh, probably several times, like I have. Um, uh, Mr. Beaker or Dracula, have you guys had a chance to run the raids yet? Just the first one. Sadly, no, because I am not of level. Yeah, we need to get you on Kyber, and you can come run with run with me and, and my group. We'll, we'll, we'll tag you, have you come along with us. Um, so there's two raids: the Curse of Strahd, which is the one that you have to run the entire quest chain to get flagged for, and then Baba's Hut, which you don't have to be flagged for; you can just go in and run. Um, and like I said last time, I said I'm guessing the reason why Baba's Hut is no flagging is because they didn't want people to have to rerun the quests. Um, they probably didn't have them tied in to do that. That's that's kind of my guess. I don't know that it's necessarily true. Um, but let's talk about Curse of Strahd, the, <laughs> the Curse of Strahd raid first. Um, <clears throat> what did you guys think of that? It was cool. Um, I like the raid. I don't... I can't really put my finger on it, and I've only run it twice. You know, it was bugged for a while, and I understand that it was still completable while it was bugged. But because, you know, in my guild, we were still learning the raid at that point, we decided just to not run it as a guild until they fixed it. And so I ran it once in the beginning and once since then. And uh, there, there's just it, – it is a cool raid. I don't know. I – there's something that just doesn't feel quite right about it to me. Like some, I feel like something should have been different, but I can't articulate that. So um, there's some interesting new mechanics. It's interesting that we now have a practical use for the uh, the hand, the Bigby's hands. It's kind of <laughs> neat. Um, so now all of a sudden, when nobody wanted those, you know, a few weeks ago, now it's like, oh, you know. Stock up on them. Anybody got some? You know, you know so that's that's kind of neat. Because the, if you haven't run the raid, there's there's one part of the raid where it's helpful if you can mark positions on a map so that, you know, because you were looking for certain things and so you can remember where they are instead of having to look for them again. Uh, yeah. So cool, cool raid. Again, without – I have to contextualize all my comments today is that I never ran Ravenloft, so there's no emotional attachment from, you know, I don't, you know, I never was in Ravenloft and pen and paper. So, you know, it's, to me, it's just a raid. And, 
you know, I definitely, you know, if I were to compare it to some, maybe some other raids, it's, it's not as fun as some some other raids, but it's cool. Um, I thought it was okay. Um, to be honest, not very Raven Lofty. Um, mm -hmm. It was more of a tactical raid, which most raids are. But, uh, I mean, the ending was cool when you got to stab him with the sword. I thought that was neat. <laughs> um... But and perhaps the I, most it, stressful thing anyone has to do in any any raid ever. Yeah, yeah. Um, but overall, I, I mean, it was it was a, a a good raid. I wish there was a, a heroic version, and not just yeah. a legendary version. Um, I concur. But the, I mean, other than that, it it was. Uh, I guess I'm middle of the road on it. Yeah, I think the. It's prob the raids are actually probably the the less good part of content. Not to say that they're bad, but they don't they do kind of feel a little bit apart from the rest of Ravenloft, right? Like they feel more like a, a DDO raid contextualized into Ravenloft as opposed to uh, Ravenloft content transposed into uh, into that. So I, I definitely can kind of get behind those comments. The things I liked about um, Curse of Strahd was it, it requires a high degree of tactics and coordination. It's not a complicated raid. There's not a lot going on. But it really rewards you and emphasizes you need to have some good tactics and coordination. Having to drop four things at roughly the same time uh, and then everyone shout at the guy with the sword to, to stab the sword in. Um <laughs> Which, like I said, I actually have people in my guild that are like, no, don't give me the sword. It's too stressful. I don't want it. Um, but I like that. I really did like that mechanic of, of really kind of having to coordinate and, and utilize these these items that they give you. Um, you get the, the icon uh, of Ravenloft. Or, sorry, is the icon of Ravenloft and the Holy Symbol or Raven kind or something like that? Um, the icon and the Holy Symbol. Uh, and then the Sun Sword. Like, you actually have to use these during the raid. They're not just there for, for kicks. Uh, and I I liked that that aspect of it and, and how they kind of tied that in. Uh, I thought the shadows were a little annoying <laughs> in terms of like dropping your hit points really fast until I, I found out that you could block and I'd avoid that. And then I'm like, oh my goodness, <laughs> a tank is so useful now. I love that. Um, so that was really nice. Uh, I probably like my most nitpicky critique of the raid was I didn't like the color of the spikes on the stairs because they're really hard to see. Uh, I would have liked them to to stand out a little bit more from from the background, um, but other than that, I, I really enjoyed running enjoyed running the raid. Uh, we've run it several times. Um, I think we're about ready to actually step up our difficulty in in my guild uh, and run a little bit harder. I do also have uh, I should mention we I recorded one of our runs. So you can you can see the raid and what what's going on um, and kind of get an idea of that. I I kind of also tried to explain what's going. It's not I don't really want to call it a guide because it's not really a a guide. Uh, but I did explain some of the stuff and kind of give an idea of what that, what it looks like. Uh, but yeah, that was kind of my my general experiences. I, I did think it would be kind of amusing if there were more than five cards, because uh, there's only five cards in the, the five tarot cards. She just draws them in a different order every time. I, I did think it would be kind of kind of been more interesting and perhaps a little bit more devious if there were like ten cards, and you, you actually found cards you didn't need. Uh, while you were in the card phase, but uh, I'm sure some people probably would find that a little too devious. You know, I I will say I'm not a big fan of raids where you've got to kill things at the same time, mm -hmm. uh, and I feel like if they're going to do that, they need to add. You know, it needs to be a a generous window because that kind of stuff is really not friendly to pugs. Um, and I'm especially thinking about killing the, you know, the phylacteries at the same time and Temple of the Death Worm, hence, you know, all the pugs just do one at a time because it's way too difficult with that tiny little kill window to do multiples. And, you know, we, I've only done Curse of Strahd on, on Epic Normal. And I found the brides, which, you you know, you basically have to kill the brides and then Strahd and then plunge the, the Sun Sword in all within a, you know, handful of seconds. The brides were irritatingly wafer thin on Normal. <laughs> so yeah, I, I yeah. wish they would have were been a little have a little more hit points so that you could prep them and and kill them and instead of just them dying by accident all the time. I, you know we're gonna learn to to deal with that. 
Uh, also, the way that the mist moves from section to section felt a little master artificery. You know, uh, yeah, I can, I can see that. The, like the electric floor moves in Master Artificer, it felt like that. So I wasn't crazy about that, but you know, it's cool. Yeah, I, I get what you're saying with the the timing thing. Um, I definitely agree with you in Temple of Deathworm that that window was too short. I will say with Strahd, what what we figured out is uh, the way that we do it is we drop Strahd first, then we kill the brides. Because Strahd has more hit points, yep. he also stays down a lot longer than the brides do. Yep. Um, but you know, once once we get it coordinated, it's not too hard. But I, yeah, I can see what you're saying, and it, it does make it a little harder for for pugs. And um, I I can understand that from it. Although I get it, I I personally love when raids are are more tactical, more coordinated. Like that's the part of of raiding that I really enjoy. I don't like like I don't like legendary shroud. Um, which seems weird because I love Shroud, but I don't like Legendary Shroud because the difficulty tends to come from things just hit harder. And I don't find that interesting. And I didn't have that problem in this raid. I, I found that the monster difficulty was, was right about where it wants to be. Um, and it's just it's a lot of paying attention to what's going on and, and supporting each other and, and protecting each other and, and that kind of thing, which I really liked. Um, but I can see what you're saying. Like, it's... Uh, probably is a little overused <laughs> that but at the same time that means it's people are used to it right so um, yeah uh, let's talk about Baba's Hut uh, which is the second raid uh, which came and came out a little bit later oh uh, which I guess Voodoo and I you will probably have to drive this conversation because we'll just run it uh, what do you think about Baba's Hut I first want to say when I first went in there and the hut animates i was just like wow this is so freaking cool i think they do a really good job at it and i realize now that like they just reskinned a spider and made it giant and put the hut on top of that but it looks cool i mean it looks like a spider that, that works right <laughs> totally works like it was i was totally unexpecting it like i guess that's the thing with baba's hut is that it does walk around but i didn't know that like i said i have no history with Ravenloft, mm -hmm. so that was like this is so cool you know so it's kind of neat to have like you have you know someone to tank the hut, and then everybody else beats on Baba. And I thought it was cool. She's float. She looks cool. She's floating around in her little skull. It's cool. Uh, the puzzles were a little annoying. I you know, I w I wish they had done. This sounds silly, but okay. Well, let's get nitpicky though. I wish they had just done something really simple, like maybe like a palette swap on the colors of the puzzle, like instead of having the the, the regular old mm. white light. Sure. If they had done like a green light with purple borders or something, like palette swaps can go a long ways. It's a cheap, it's a very quick and inexpensive way to change the flavor of something. I mean, just think of, you know, Sub Zero and Scorpion from Mortal Kombat, you know? It's just a palette swap, but they're two totally different characters, different brand. You know, so if they just done a palette, like when I was doing those puzzles, I felt like I was in House Canis, you know, because they mm -hmm. just had that, that vibe to them. But my biggest gripe with this one is essentially having to do the whole raid twice. That is so boring, irritating, totally not necessary. No reason that we couldn't have just gone through all that once. Uh, maybe to add a little length to it, maybe, maybe we have to beat down the hut in the final fight or something. But uh, Or at least made it, like if we're going to go through the hut twice, at least make it different. Yeah, it's... Doing everything, literally everything twice is just... I agree, yeah. Dumb. Even if they just made it, the puzzles... I like that the puzzles aren't difficult puzzles, and it's really more about getting the scarecrows down at the same time. Again, the coordination aspect of it, which I think is 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 really good. And I, I understand that, again, what you're saying. It, it's a little difficult for, for pugs. Uh, but I think that it's a raid. There needs to be some sort of tactics, and, and group coordination should be expected. Um and I don't think it's that hard to kind of, if at least if one person kind of knows what's going on, to, to get some coordination going as, as long as people are paying attention. I get, what you're, neat. I get what you're saying. But... It, it was neat how we had to split up the party. Mm -hmm. One person's like above, one, or one group is above, one group below, and you can see them through the grating. Yeah. And you have to like route the light down to them so they can finish their puzzle and vice versa. I thought that was kind of neat. And I'm not even a big fan of splitting up the party, but I. I did think that was kind of cool. Yeah, I think the the biggest downfall of this raid is 
you do the same puzzles twice. You know, even if they, I was kind of thinking what you're talking about, like changing the color of the, the light. It would have been neat if you went in the second, like one time it was one color. And the, you know, in um, Dream Conspiracy, that optional puzzle, there's a gem that kind of moves around on the puzzle. Uh-huh. It would have been neat if there was uh, a gem that moved around on the puzzles that you had to to route the light through to kind of change it up a little bit. Um, I could definitely see an argument to be made of um, making the hut portion twice as long and just make it different so you didn't have to run it twice. Um, I, I think... Oh, go ahead. No, you, you go ahead. Well, another thing, too, you know, when I said that when I was doing the puzzles, I felt like I was in House Caneth. There, those floor, those tie, kind of tile puzzles did not feel raven lofty at all. They just felt like they shouldn't be there. So maybe a different kind of a puzzle or some different activity. Yeah, it, the rep- repetition part is kind of the the boring part of the raid. Um, I I don't mind that you fight Baba three times. That that works for me. But it's, it's the the second time through the hut. It's it's the exact same thing. Uh, so there, there is that kind of weird aspect aspect to it. Um, but I do like the first time through. Like, I like the mechanics. I like you're doing a puzzle that you have to get these scarecrows down to actually do the puzzle. Uh, and again, that coordination thing. I also liked the uh, the shambling mounds at the end, um, and kind of how that whole end fight works, where it, the mechanics that the shambling mounds do punishes you for ignoring them very drastically in fact um so i, I kind of liked uh how they they kind of created a, a different mechanic that uh encourages you to hey you need to deal with these guys you can't just completely ignore them so so many mobs that were unintimidatable was pretty irritating yeah the scarecrows you, know, you can't intimidate yeah. scarecrows i can't remember what the shambling mounds um will-o'-wisps and it in, in the end fight i just really felt like they threw everything including the kitchen sink at you <laughs> I wasn't Hutt's really crazy about that. Well, see, maybe they, maybe that's what they should have done is just have the hut there, get rid of some of the trash. Have the a respawn hut, rates hut until crew. you get the uh, shambling mounds done are pretty annoying. I will say like, the, yeah. the wisps come up a little too fast. Um, there, there's a kind of a funny thing, and I don't know that it was necessarily intentional, but I actually kind of I don't like wisps in general, but I I kind of appreciated yeah, that either. the wisps in this. Um, they are they're very resistant to magical attacks, uh, but like a, a paralyzing arrows, uh, quivering palm, assass- you can assassinate them, uh, even which all kind of put a little bit more value on having those kind of characters. And you can hurl them too, I think. Um, but like those kind of attacks uh, really become pretty valuable when you're dealing with the wisps to try and keep the numbers down and and make it a little bit more manageable. Um, Did you say the trash stops spawning after the? Shambling mounds are dead. At least the wisps do. Okay, I didn't realize that. Uh, and the shambling mounds, they have a pretty nasty special attack. You don't have to kill them to stop that, but they, they do this thing uh, where um, we call it arching because it looks like an arch around them. But if you've seen the... Um, oh, the druids have, have a, a, a blazing sun aura thing. Body of the sun. Yeah, that. And there's also a, a version of that in um, Draconic Incarnation uh, Epic Destiny. They do something similar to that. And when they start doing that, you have if you don't do enough damage to them, they'll hit everyone with a hit point debuff, which is really debilitating. Uh, on hard, I think it... I'm trying to remember the numbers. I think on hard, it was 75%. On normal, it's 50 And elite, I think it's like 90% hit point debuff. <laughs> so it's really debilitating. Um but I really liked that mechanic in the sense that you don't even have to kill him. You just have to like, oh, this it's doing this special. It's building up the special attack. If you hit it a bunch of times, it, it doesn't do it. So that was really neat. So, um, I think with anything else you want to say about Baba's Hut or Curse's oh. Tribe? Change it so that we only have to go through it once. Yeah, would be nice. I don't think it's gonna happen, but. Um, all right, I, I want to next, we'll finish our talk about content. Uh, I want to talk about the DM work, which the thing that really jumped out to me right off the bat is unlike the um, the other content that was developed from 
source material, pen and paper, there wasn't one big name doing it, which was kind of the first thing. But two, they, they had a lot of people doing the work. Um, it was really divided up. Um, but there was a lot of DM work, so I thought we should uh, just kind of at least briefly, what, what did you think of the DM work? I liked it. I, I It's one of the first times I had the DM audio turned on for the entire the entire quest chain. I normally have my DM audio off. I turned it on for part of the first time I ran through it. Um, I just find that it interferes with party chat too much. So it, it doesn't stick out to me from what I remember. But I'm not, you know, like I said, I'm not really big into having that on anyways. The creepy kids' voices were spectacular. I yes, I can't, I can't say that enough. Yeah, I yeah, didn't even exactly. have it on for that one, so I can't say, you know. Oh, you you have to go back through Death House with that DM audio on just to hear those creepy kids. Yes, absolutely. Um, all right, so then let's do this. Let's talk about uh, Vistani Knife Fighter really quick, uh, and then for our next. Next time we'll talk about loot uh, in general. Uh, one, have you played Vistani Night Fighter? And two, did you, what do you think about it? Um, I have one that I started just for Ravenloft. Um, it's okay. Uh, you combine it with uh, Ranger Tempest, and it uh, gives you some good options. Um, it, it's a good... I mean, visually, it, it has its appeal look to it. Um, but as far as the tree itself goes... Um, yeah, com I'm combining it with Ranger and I, I think it's working out pretty well. Um, is it, is it overpowered? No, I, that, that's still within everybody's personal quest builds, uh, or, or alt builds, but, um, I, I think it's a good addition, um, uh, whether you use it or not, it's kind of cool and everybody loves their Vistani Night Fighter cosmetics. I see them everywhere. So, uh, you know, it, it uh. I think it's uh, I think it's a good addition. I do love the attack animation. It does it it does look pretty neat. Um, I haven't really gotten into it, uh, but I've used it a, a small amount, um, mostly because the the characters that I would probably most likely use it with are not characters that I'm really playing anymore. Uh, I I'm probably we we had talked about Ferdito Kasplat actually having everyone be Vistani Knife Fighter. I don't know if that's something that's going to happen. Um, we we talked about it, but um, it does. I do like the it. It works for me um, in the sense of what it's there for. I don't know that it really changes my game play any, or like me and my builds really. I exclusively play casters, so I haven't played as a Vistani tree. It's it's melee, so from an outsider's perspective, I'll just say like I think that adds some cool flavor. Some of my guildies are really enjoying it. Some of the abilities look powerful. But like I said, I, I have no experience with it. Looks cool, though. I do like how it, it functions a little bit differently. Like, there's a click that, that adds to your critical um, damage uh, and profile. Uh, I, I like kind of how that is a little functionally different than some of the other options that you could do. Um, I also tend not to be someone who likes a lot of clicks <laughs> on their melees. Um, it's a little too... Mostly just from a standpoint of I've only got so many spots on my hotbar. <laughs> Like I can only reach so many numbers in certain combinations effectively to the point that I know some people can do it better than I can, but like one through zero is pretty much as much as I can do. I don't really do the control, uh, like link other options to them. So um, I do know that it, it is kind of fun to see. Um, I have a, a gildy who actually has a uh, Vistani cleric, <laughs> which is kind of an interesting uh, little build. Uh, so I, I do enjoy kind of seeing some of those. I, I was actually contemplating um, one of my characters is going through uh, some wizard pass lives right now. I, I was actually contemplating doing a throwing dagger, um, Sharati magic missile build. I don't know if I'm going to actually do that still, but I, I was kind of thinking about it. Um, so there, there's, it opens up some options, which I think is nice. Uh, let's see. We get a little bit of time, um, so let's talk about some of the other stuff, and again, we'll talk about loot next. Um, we talked about uh, Ravenloft being relatively clean, 
bug wise, uh, which I think is important. It's not to say there weren't any bugs, but it felt to me like this release had a lot fewer issues with it. I and was they surprised. Jumped, I and really they jumped was. on and they jumped on him right away. Yeah. There were a couple issues that were making it making it uh some quests uncompletable, uh depending on, on what happened, but they they got on that pretty quick. They even came in on Saturday and, and did a uh a fix for that. Um there was the bug with Curse of Strahd, which made it very difficult to kill him. Um, but I mean, it was still completable, but it was a little, a little annoying. But those were kind of the big ones. Everything else seemed to be fairly minor. We do have the hitching, though. The hitching is really, really irritating, and a lot of people, myself included, were having DC issues. Like I said earlier, uh, mm -hmm. I stopped disconnecting after the patch, which I'm very happy for, uh, but the hitching is, uh, is seems to be affecting everybody, and is starting to get really, really irritating. It's yeah, the I end agree. of the world, but it's annoying. I agree with that. It is very, very annoying. And yeah, too, after that patch, I don't disconnect anymore, but I still hitch and I still freeze. And it's just, like you said, very, very annoying. So I hope they can figure out exactly what's going on with that. I had it a little before Ravenloft, but after Ravenloft, it got much worse for me, at least. And it sounds like I'm not the only one. Well, and I have a theory about that, too. Now, a couple of my guildies have a little bit older computers, and we've noticed that we've had to turn our graphics down a little bit. So, you know, especially when we're in the outdoor area, things were getting a little jaggedy. We're like, oh, are we getting lag? No, no, it's just your graphics. Everybody's got their graphics set to very high. And I think that there was a little bit of a, let's call it a computer performance jump. Maybe not a jump, maybe a, a, a skip. Um, at least that's what I've noticed on my end. So I've turned my graphics down a little bit just for Ravenloft, and my hitching seems to have gone away. I think it's tied to more like spell casting and certain abilities because it happens big time to me when I do Displacement, when I do Rejuvenation Cocoon, when I do Sacred Ground. Uh, those are the big ones, but definitely some others. Yeah, it's probably the. It's not fun, that's for sure. But um, I still find that it, it, it's probably one of the cleanest updates we've had in a while. Is kind of what I still come back to. If there's a few, I totally agree, and I I give them props for that. Yeah. So I don't want it to sound like there the are issues that need to be fixed, obviously. Um, but I think the hitching one is kind of really the one that's that's left and there and disconnects and stuff like that. Um, they did add a lot of frills in this this uh, update, which is why they added the ability to try and turn frills off and stuff like that. Um, I think that's what it was. Uh, but yeah, I, I think even even with those things, it seemed like like they didn't break a whole bunch of other stuff uh, with it, which I think was, was really uh, important. But uh... And let's put this into context, too, because it, it's the smoothest rollout of our three expansions, and it's smoother than most updates. Yeah. So like I, said, I give them credit for that. Like I, I really expected there to be all kinds of problems, and... You know, like I said before, when it wasn't without its problems, but they were relatively minor. Menace of the Underdark came out, and they had to close the raid right away for like two weeks. So there was nothing game breaking. No. Uh, there were two other things I wanted to make sure that we talked about, uh, and if we've got just enough time, I think to cover them. One is they changed tome applications. At what levels you get your your bonuses for tomes, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, so you get your tomes earlier, which is great, uh, and. It looks like they're leaving room for um, one. There's plus eight tomes in the game now, um, but it seems like they they left a little bit of room for uh, higher level tomes as well. Well, they would say that it would be nice to see higher numbers for the not stat tomes, <laughs> like the PRR and MRR and power tomes. You can only get plus two for those. You'd, you'd think that we need. Well, yeah. I mean, I've got 120,000 remnants in my bank now. <laughs> I need something to spend them on. Let's come out with the plus threes already. Plus three, four, or fives. I mean, it's yeah. not. These are not that game. I think the plus seven to a stat is is worth a lot more than <laughs> than some of those. Um, so that would be kind of neat. But uh, any thoughts on how they change the, the tome leveling? Oh, my guess is it's a big seller in the store. Um, you, you can't deny. You can't deny that that's probably one of the best selling items in the store. So, reworking that system makes sense. 
And then the other thing that I wanted to make sure that we mentioned was um, the scrolling examine windows. <laughs> Hallelujah, praise the Lord. <laughs> you know, that is something I didn't realize I wanted until they put it in there. And then I'm like, holy crap, why have we never had this before? This is amazing. Yeah, we really needed that. Is there a way to scroll back up once? Because I don't like how it automatically scrolls down, but I didn't try using my mouse wheel. If you open the examine window, I think you can scroll up and down. I think if it's a pop-up one, it just scrolls down. Okay. I think. I think that's how that works. We definitely need it. I'm glad they added something like that finally. Yeah. It's having gone having on numerous occasions had to switch to my muck dooms to with my equipped weapons so that I can see what I'm looking at for compare the comparison pop up. It's great. <laughs> it's really helpful. Uh so what was that? Uh aside from loot, is there anything else you guys want to talk about with the update? All right. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, join us next time. We'll finish our discussion on, on our review for Ravenloft uh, by talking about loot. Uh, I want to thank my guests today, Voodoo, Evil Beaker, and Draculetta. Uh, if you'd like to support the show, you can visit our website, dudacast.com, or you can support us on Patreon. You can also find show notes, past shows, and swag on our website. Uh, and you can also find us on social media and follow us for latest at cast updates. Uh, I'm at dudacast on Twitter. Uh, Draculetta is uh, at <laughs> Draculetta is underscore 72. Yes, correct. Uh, and uh, at DDO Players, just DDO Players, not DDO Players News, right? Correct. Just at DDO Players. Yep. Um, if you'd like to join the discussion, you can leave a comment or email us, uh, ddocast at gmail.com. Uh, until next time, may all your attack rolls be crits, all your tests level appropriate. Have fun, and don't forget to gather for buffs. Mm-hmm.